This is The Fire These Times, and I'm your host, Joey Ayub. In this third season, we will be exploring internationalist solidarity, prefigurative politics, solar punk, and how to tackle some of the most pressing challenges of our times. Each episode will be on one or more of these topics. But before getting into today's topic, I wanted to quickly tell you that you can support this podcast for as little as two or five dollars a month on patreon.com slash fire these times. That is patreon.com slash fire these times. If you cannot donate, you can still support by sharing it with your friends and families and leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This helps it get more exposure and introduce it to more folks. That's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. So my name is Luca. I go by they, them pronouns. I am a podcaster. I work in media and... And your podcast is, na- is called Solar Punk Now. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Uh, my podcast is Solar Punk Now. Um, it's, you know, philosophy, politics, theory, art, sort of this intersection of art, science, and politics that's all about practical ideas for realizing a better future, not just a reformist future, but actually a radically progressive mm-hmm. future. And my... Research before I started the podcast um, was a lot on neoliberalism and specifically looking at neoliberal subjectivity. So, like what it is to be a subject of neoliberalism, what what sort of mental formations that mm-hmm. creates, how we think about ourselves and others, uh, how we think about our behaviors in the world, and how a, a big part of that is like how economics manifests in everyday life. Um, it's sort of made this transition from the academic research world to like how we think of our everyday behaviors. Um, and so that's a really critical, uh, I guess it's it's a really critical way that we can feel trapped in capitalism or neoliberalism. And I think it's really important to understanding uh, our current predicament and how we get out of it. Um, mm-hmm. And so solar punk for me, uh, it's kind of an experiment. I'm I'm trying it on for size, uh, but so far it seems to be a really good like antidote to a lot of the ways that I see us being trapped in our current status quo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, depending, we'll see how the conversation goes. I might change the <laughs> title, but for now, like it's I think it's some it's going to be something along the lines of solo punk and neoliberal selfhood or or subjectivities, maybe something along those lines. We'll see um talk to that's a good that's a good place to start i think just talk to us about like for those who don't know any anything you just said (laughs) what does that actually mean (laughs) what 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 do you mean by like how we is it like how we think of ourselves under uh neoliberalism essentially and kind of explain that a bit if that's okay okay yeah for sure how how far should i go back should i define neoliberalism (laughs) go for it do that i mean it's so difficult but go for it Yeah, I mean, so everybody everybody has their own, like, pet definition of neoliberalism. And that's, mm-hmm. I think it's cool and fun and funny, but also maybe part of the problem and why uh, messaging doesn't get through sometimes. People love to hate on the term and say, like, oh, neoliberalism just means whatever you don't like. Um, yeah. But no, that's not, that's not how I see it. I see it as a specific... Um, philosophy or intellectual tradition. There are there are distinct thinkers you can point to in the history of um, economic thinking, and they have gotten together and done these conferences. I don't want to make it sound like a total conspiracy or something, but you know, it is a a philosophy that there are books about that you can read, and it's been really influential on policy, especially after World War II and the fall mm-hmm. of the Soviet Union. It's kind of become like the new. Uh, the new paradigm for political economic policy making, um, and it's also it's got this really, uh, I guess, personal dimension to it. We we've sort of internalized a lot of it. Um, so, one example I that I no, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah. Like one example that I usually uh, think of is one. What, we we have this tendency. Most folks listening probably can identify with this, uh, like. Even when you're on a break, like even when you're not quote unquote working, like legally, this is like your work hours or you have to, if someone goes to an office or whatever, a lot of folks are these days unable to 
pause their brains. Like they kind of were always thinking in productive terms, like, oh, you know, I could do this in the next two hours, or I should be doing something now, even though this something is sometimes not even defined, at least in my case. Um, mm. You know, that that's one of the ways that there was this book. Um, I forgot the name. The guy has a like super Dutch family name. I forgot the name, but uh, it's like the self under. OK, ignore folks can Google something self identity and market market identity. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this is useless. Sorry. Ignore me, listeners. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> this sounds but, familiar. I might see if it's in my reading list. Hang on. Yeah, I think first name is Paul. <laughs> that That's as useful <laughs> as I'm getting here. But essentially, like when I read it, it was one of those books recommended by Georges Mobio at some point. It was like in 2016 when I read it. And it also went into this, like th- this idea that even when we're not doing what we are, quote unquote, required to do, you know, for most folks who like have, let's say, a job or a regular job or what have you, especially if it's like a nine to five thing or whatever, we still have some something in us is not like the separation between work and personal life, let's say, is not as rigid anymore in that sense. Totally. Yeah. Um, uh, I did not find the name that's, of the book, uh, but we can it. move on. So <laughs> um, I had this moment, uh, must have been a couple weeks ago, I was falling asleep and I was thinking, okay, I've got a few minutes now before I fall asleep. What can I do with my brain that would be like productive, that would set me up for my day tomorrow? Mm-hmm. It's like that level of every Every minute in your 24-hour day, even when you're sleeping, it has to be optimized. It has to be productive. You have to be investing in your human capital. Um, and that that comes from the enterprise model of the self or the enterprise model of um, human being. And that was something that Foucault introduced. This great series of lectures called The Birth of Biopolitics. Um, and that's, that's just a really great introduction, both to the intellectual history of neoliberalism that I was talking about, um, but also this enterprise model that, um, he sort of, uh, outlines a framework for. So under classical economics, uh, which would be like classical liberalism, the understanding of, of human beings is as like rational economic actors in a market. And what, what is relevant for classical economics is our behaviors in the aggregate. So supply and demand, um, these sort of like trends that once enough people are behaving in a market situation, making choices, you can say, okay, the demand is at this level or whatever. Um, but with neoclassical economics, uh, it gets this sort of update um, where market analysis is then extended to the individual and the individual becomes something that can be analyzed with these economic tools. So what you see is a transformation from us just as actors making choices to enterprises like um, we are each of us our own company competing against other companies. And that metaphor maybe isn't isn't the full picture, but it's a pretty good place to start for understanding why we feel like we always have to be productive. It's because we're a collection of assets and productivity is one of our assets. Mm -hmm. So if we're not constantly working on improving that or happiness is another one, we have to be happy so that we can be more productive. Um, You know, we're not competing effectively if we're not constantly working on investing in that human capital. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the um, kind of like the, the fault lines for me in some sense when I think of like my own past it's I used to be and I still am to some extent but like to like it's been kind of um, diminished let's put it that way or weakened but I used to be really into languages and language Mm -hmm. learning uh, quite literally just for the fun of it like there was no I was I grew up in Lebanon and there was no point learning Japanese like it didn't it did not further my my career in any way shape or form but I did it um, I don't speak much of it but I learned a bit like basics and stuff just because it was fun there was really no other purpose and that uh, time spent like you know on it which is like I, I, I never calculated obviously because that was part of it but you know days and weeks and months or whatnot uh, it's much more difficult to do now, uh, obviously, because I'm a, I'm on a different age. I have different responsibilities, blah blah blah. But also because I've internalized a lot of the past decade and and this idea of having to maximize, you know, personal branding and that sort of thing. I've done my best to both at the same time. I have to sort of play that game on the internet to some extent, 
while at the same time constantly having to fight against it and push back and not let it define me. So I, it, I literally go through like ups and downs basically. At times like I need to take a step back. I almost quit social media like 10 times maybe in the past decade, you know, different things. Um, but as it happens, you know, I'm still kind of in that world. I'm trying to balance needing to be in that world for like financial reasons or whatever, while at the same time, having this like life that doesn't entirely depend on it and whatnot and the balance is pretty difficult and even that even being able to strike some kind of balance as i said a pretty pretty weak one one that doesn't necessarily last too long often and i have i go through phases as i said like a few months where i'm just reading about how i need to you know relax and take control of my own time and blah 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 and then other months where i'm like completely into it and stuck glued to my phone and you know what have you but even that is, in some sense, uh, a privilege these days, which is saying a lot, uh, not not a lot of good things. But it says a lot because most folks actually don't have even that time, or at least the, the, the resources needed to, or yeah, I mean, I think folks know what I'm talking about, like the time to, to sit down with yourself and not have to survive economically or whatever. But we're not necessarily talking about that, right? Like we're not talking about... And I, I hope it comes, it's obvious to listeners, but like, I'm also not blaming anyone for not doing better. Actually, that's the entire point is that doing better and always, always needing to optimize the self and whatnot is literally part of the problem. But it's so difficult that even the language of, because, you know, it's like the, the, um, the analogy I have sometimes is like when we think of growth in the sense of like economic growth, the term growth sounds positive, right? And it's easy to uh, confuse that with like obs uh, obsessing over GDP and you know that sort of thing when the actual indicators for like a happy life or a stable life usually don't have much to do with that actually sometimes it, it stops and there are episodes on this folks can 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 go back to the I forgot the name of the title one of them was with Julia Steinberg I remember so folks can can there's like two or three episodes with her one of them will be the obvious one so that that's one of those things so when you say stuff like degrowth right it sounds like well, we're having stuff, 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 more things, more things, and now we're going to stop having those things, and that's not a good thing. Because even in the language of degrowth, for example, we, like I'm, I'm part of that movement, we have to sort of use a language, like kind of literally borrow the language from growth, essentially, economic growth at the very least, in order to make the case for degrowth because it's become so hegemonic. And even when it comes to, you know, I want to be able to take proper breaks. I want to enjoy naps. I want to sleep, whatnot. I find myself looking up the tools to do so uh, in the same way as I would like optimize my note taking and my productivity and my whatnot. Like the, it's gotten so hegemonic that even it's almost like I forgot that this is literally something one can do like naturally with one's body and whatnot. But that, that, that's where we're at. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a trip being a like a a leftist thinker who's still like very much participating in these things that I'm criticizing like mm -hmm. I'm so aware of like oh my god the fact that I'm beating myself up right now for not being productive that that kind of thing is what I am trying to fight against or like point out how peculiar and arbitrary that is but it's still it's still there in my brain. It's still like so foundational to how I think about my life and what I'm doing. Um, there's a German philosopher, Byung Chul Han, mm -hmm. who talks about this sort of internalization of power. Um, and his book uh, is called Psychopolitics. He's got a couple books, um, but that's probably the one I would recommend starting with. Um, and Psychopolitics is sort of a reformulation or a, an extension of Foucault's concept of biopolitics. Um, and it's where neoliberal power has, uh, I think the, the way he summarizes it, or like the subtitle of the book is like how neoliberal power has discovered the mind or the psyche as a field of domination or a mm -hmm. field of productivity. Um, so, you know, our, our psyches are in a sense complicit in this structure of power we reinforce it in like our negative self-talk to ourselves um it's it's not just that so, something that i think is really critical about this it's not just that we internalize it or believe it it's not just you know we accept our subjugation or whatever we we enforce it on ourselves we become 
the the manager of the employee. So like if you think of the mind or the self as as a capitalist firm, we are both our manager and our employees. We're managing ourselves, we're disciplining and punishing ourselves. Um and our our behaviors on social media um they they start out as you know it's just it's exciting it's exciting to connect with your friends share about your life there's a lot like when i first got a computer or a phone and started exploring what was out there it was it was really fun and i didn't even realize the ways that by participating in that i was sort of aligning my my desire, my enjoyment with power. So under this new system, we there's maybe like this classical model that people have of like a factory of like the place where labor happens and there's like this boss that's like disciplining his employees really harshly and like you better get back to work and they all resent him. Um but what happens now is desire is actually cultivated and it's cultivated in these ways where we think we're just enjoying ourselves and maximizing our self-pleasure, but actually the ways that we do that are complicit in power. We're participating in mass surveillance, like mm-hmm. willingly, pleasure, pleasurably. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it, pleasure becomes an asset for us to maximize because it makes us happier and more productive. Um, and as long as we're consuming something in our self-care as long as our self-care is financially benefiting someone it's not a waste mm-hmm. yeah I, like the the um, other side of that and oh i mean one of the yeah i mean it's multifaceted obviously right and one of them is for example uh, myself as a writer uh one of the things that kind of freaked me out at one point is when i realized that i was actually catering a lot of not just my writing but my thoughts on how they they might look like in a Twitter thread. Like quite mm. literally this started, like I started picturing it in, in those terms. And the thing is that it's a normal thing to do in the same way when you're writing, let's say pre-social media on your laptop, you start picturing your text on the screen on the laptop, right? And before that, the typewriter or whatever. So like the, the mind is doing something that's very normal for it, like for us, right? It's just that the difference this time, if we're talking specifically about like surveillance capitalism, which is a an element of neoliberal capitalism, at least a more recent one, more recent manifestation. Um, I get I get fuzzy on like the specific differences at some point, but I know that like if you want to chronologically, like neoliberalism really peaked or at least started dominating in the 80s and since then has continued. And surveillance capitalism obviously is, is more recent in that sense, let's say decade, decade and a half, maybe two decades or so. The difference is that between like, let's say the laptop in and of itself and the laptop or let's say my me as a writer on the laptop and me as a writer um, on Twitter or whatever, is that Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, uh, are not neutral places, right? Like they're not, they're, they're, they're actually talking back to you, so to speak. They're, they're, they're surveying you quite literally. This is how the algorithm works. I think many folks kind of understand the gist of things, although the details for most folks are kind of very difficult to, for me as well, like to grasp because for one, Usually the algorithm isn't open anyway. You don't know how much data they have on you. You don't actually know how much it works. But okay, let's digress a bit from surveillance capitalism because that, that's obviously one one of those aspects. In the first episode of this year, <laughs> of 2023, I'm talking as if we're already in January, <laughs> uh, but it's going to come out in January for most folks, except for Patreon supporters. Head out to patreon.com slash fire these times. <laughs> so- the first episode is going to be with Andre. The first episode of the year is going to be with Andre, who you know, you, you've had him on your podcast. So he, he had the, uh, it's called Hydroponic Trash is, is the, the, Twitter, the Twitter and TikTok handle. And we talked about um, Mark Fisher's last, or at least the title comes from Mark Fisher's last uh, series of lectures um, on post-capitalist desire. And the link, obviously, there's gonna, it's kind of a theme a bit in the first few episodes of January. Obviously, it's intentional. Um, but talk to us a bit like your understanding within what you were talking about, like the self and neoliberalism, all of that. Um, what is, how do you understand capitalist realism for folks who, who don't know what that is? So capitalist realism is a term that was coined by Mark Fisher um, in his book by the same name. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of other people have talked about it there are a lot of other terms that are kind of close to it um but the the core of it is sort of this 
I guess I would say naturalization or normalization of capitalism as uh, the only way or the best way that things can be done. It shows up after the fall of the Soviet Union when, you know, here was this very, very prominent example of not capitalism that you couldn't ignore. And then we saw that it failed. It was like, well, okay, I guess there is no alternative to capitalism. So that's the um, that's the Margaret Thatcher quote, right? Is that there is no alternative. Um, so it's got it's got this very pessimistic dimension to it because it's not so much divine. It, it's not so much defined through positivity as negativity. It's like, well, we can't do any of these other things, so we're stuck with capitalism. Um, and the best thing you can do is accept it, make the best of it, be the most productive self as enterprise that you can, try to get ahead, be responsible for yourself and your family. Um, but yeah, it, it's this very like pessimistic kind of cynical view of the world. I hear it so much. I hear so many people say like, you know, I don't like capitalism, but I don't know what else there could be. It seems like the best thing we've got. Or you might hear someone say, well, capitalism and communism are both bad, uh, but therefore I'm just going to stick with the status quo. So it doesn't require you to like uh, positively buy in to uh, the theories of capitalism. You don't have to like think that it's correct that it's the best way so much as you have to just accept it yeah um you have to believe and... that there is no alternative quite li like it is yeah so i didn't mean to interrupt but like it is it is like the other side of obviously market thatcher's thing is that she would also say uh she said once like there's no such thing as society right like that's because it's the natural outcome in many ways if there is no alternative to this economic phenomena or whatever a political economic phenomena that's all about individ individuals but also individualization in the sense that things we are we're no longer a community we're no longer a society we don't belong to something else other than maybe ourselves and for conservatives uh, at best maybe your family although the family ends up being kind of an extension of the self in this very patriarchal way then you know it, it kind of it's a logical conclusion of, of, of that of that um, of that logic right like of that philosophy yeah Totally. That's something that's really interesting to me about um, neoliberal theory or philosophy. Uh, it's again, it's it's this normalization um, when so so when you say that there is no such thing as society, um, it's all individuals. You know, some theorists took that took that very seriously, and there's this whole neoliberal project that is investigating and explaining the world and and explaining society by breaking down the concept of society and trying to explain everything in terms of individual behavior in terms of self-interest you get um theorists like gary becker um in his like acceptance of the Nobel prize in economics he talks about how altruism can be explained as a selfish individualist behavior it's really interesting he's like well you know, parents might be seen as selfless for like raising their kids, doing everything for their kids, but they're actually just investing in their kids so that their kids will be productive in the future and then provide back for the parents. Like it's a return on investment sort of thing. So the the realm of the social and the moral and the political gets totally collapsed down into individual economic behaviors and the aggregate of those behaviors. And so capitalist realism has this like, I guess, scientific um, economic dimension to it, or I guess I should say scientistic, not scientific, right? It's this sort of like valorization of science um, without, without the sort of critical reflection of, well, are these economic theories really the best way to understand people? We, we just sort of take it for granted that, yeah, okay, there are markets and individuals, that is all there is. So we might as well just do the best we can within that rather than actually considering what other theories could be used to understand the world. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one, I think the term capitalist realism is so useful because it allows you to understand that when one says, you know, that 
let's let's put it this way often when you can have you can imagine the scenario as you know i think lots of folks would have had it i've certainly had it well like i talk about alternatives to capitalism and whatnot the person on like the opposite side of that debate like imagine i'm kind of a straw man figure here whatever but isn't they don't necessarily disagree with my intentions maybe or they don't say that yeah maybe you know whatnot but you know you gotta be realistic about things like they they position themselves as the realists are quite literally the realists and you're the idealists and that binary obviously is is i think part of the problem but let, let's take it as such the realists quote unquote in this framework believe in this thing called homo economicus i.e like again this pre-neoliberalism even classical liberalism as you mentioned like you know the irrational person kind of it, that person was imagined as a man uh, not coincidentally obviously you know a rational person who is able to you know rationally think about x y and z and through the magic of the invisible hand of the market uh supply and demand so obviously you want this or x amount of people want this therefore there's going to be some kind of supply to meet that demand now, I think many folks by now understand that that's not quite as simple as that. And I think more recently, especially with social media, it's become a bit more easy to to understand, I think, that the desire, because part of the assumption of the rational person is that the desire that you have is your own. You know, okay, maybe maybe advertisers can nudge you in a certain direction, but this is still your own decision, right? Like that's part of the of the myth, that's part of the idea. And because we think in this, uh, or at least I, I think the part of it is a bit of a natural, I don't know, natural, but in, in understandable, let's put it this way. We don't want to think, we don't want to believe that we're this easily influenceable, right? Like we, we're still... We, this advertising doesn't affect me that much, right? Or if I if I do buy it after watching it, it's actually because I really wanted to do so, you know? We don't want to believe that we're that malleable as as selves, as, as individuals and whatnot. And I'm not saying that, you know, this isn't a conspiracy. This is not rocket science. This isn't like, oh, actually, those very smart people behind closed doors are just making you believe that you want to buy this Adidas, whatever. It's, it's not like that. It's more that the... <laughs> I trapped myself now because I said it's not that and now I have to say what it is. <laughs> Shit. But I mean, part of what it is, is this idea that we live in a certain world and that this world has very specific rules and regulations and a certain logic to it. And you may not like it, but if you don't like it, well, you're just not, you're being an idealist. You're just not being realistic. You're not participating in the world. You're not doing your part, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you can take this to different conclusions when you start from from sort of this assumption. And what I find interesting in like your project, uh, I think what I'm trying to do as well, what so many folks these days, which is very interesting and very nice, and I hope more of them start popping up, thinking about these actual alternatives and not just in a, again, using that binary before in this quote unquote idealistic way, but quite literally thinking like very concretely, what why can how can we have this better model this better society this better what have you in this pre prefigurative way which is one of the unofficial themes of 2023 on this podcast like prefigurative <laughs> politics acting or like having a politics today based on this ideal right based on this thing so talk to us a bit about that because i know you're kind of thinking along the same line like we had this chat uh, prior to we had like a gmail chat before to before like uh, recording and where do you see the sort of the link between that impulse and and solar punk right with the title of uh, solar punk now the title of your podcast sure yeah um i also just wanted to mention real quick um you know, uh, how you, you were saying you were trapped in a corner of like, well, it's not that there are people behind closed doors just manipulating you. Um, you you're, I mean, you're totally right. There is never just that direct link of like, we're being mindlessly controlled. We're all sheep. Like, that's only part of the truth. Um, but there is a history of a very concerted, a very concerted effort of psychological science influencing PR firms and advertising and industries like the happiness industry, um, psychiatry, even we don't need to get too much into that. That's complicated. Um, but that's more my personal beef. But, you know, there, there are industries out there whose goal it is to manipulate consumers because there is this understanding of the consumer um, as so we, we 
the focus is on the choice at the margin. So that's the moment you're at the store, you're deciding, should I buy this brand of juice? Should I buy this brand of juice? Should I buy no juice? That's You have a choice to make. Which one will improve your uh, utility? Which one... In, in that moment, you are, you're imagined by economists as like kind of a passive input and output system. It's very behaviorist, very physicalist. It's not about your free will in that moment. So de- debating about whether we have free will in those situations is a whole other story. But, th- you know, there are industries and fields of research that understand you and try to operate on you as such. So I just wanted to make a note of that. The advertising industry is very powerful, has gotten a lot of resources over the years. It's also only like a hundred years old or a couple hundred, depending upon where you want to put the start date. We lived most of our lives as as a species, as humanity, with nothing like the advertising industry that we have today. And we somehow, we take it for granted as like central to our experience, but... Um, before you before you so, continue on the I, <laughs> yeah. you you had a tangent so I can have one too. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm joking. But the, you know there are campaigns around the world. I know there's one here in Geneva where I live, uh, of having a no advertising outside um, policy, like you know those billboards and and that sort of thing. And I find it very interesting uh, for the reasons that we're talking about now, that it's not like more popular than it is, right? Like I think I think eventually once they kind of get enough votes, enough momentum, enough what have you, probably it will happen. It's It has already happened in some cities. I, I'm spacing out on some names, but I know that it does exist in some cities around the world. But it's interesting that most of us have grown so used to them of seeing this ad. You know, growing up, I remember seeing like Marlboro ads in Lebanon before those were kind of phased out for obvious reasons. But um, we're sort of very used to it. It's almost like if this doesn't happen, how am I going to find out how where to do this X, Y, and Z, or where to buy this product, or where to you know subscribe to this, what what have you? And I think I think it's I won't go too much into it, but I think it's interesting to wonder, kind of like as a thinking exercise to listeners, like why is it difficult to even picture getting out of your house, walking to or taking the bus or driving or whatever towards work or towards i don't know dropping off your kids or whatever 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 you do on a daily basis whatever that that activity looks like and not being able to not picture those billboards because i think that's that's a very interesting thought experiment i've tried to do it and i i genuinely have difficulties picturing the neighborhood i live in without those billboards but yeah sorry totally no i think i think that's actually a great segue into solar punk um what what I like about solar punk is it asks a lot of questions like that. Like why, why not just imagine a world that does have X or doesn't have Y? Why do we consider, why do we take all these things that are very, um, very just not arbitrary, but like they're historical artifacts. It's, we just, we happen to live in a world with advertising, but it's perfectly reasonable to imagine a world that didn't have advertising because for a very, very long time. We did not have advertising. And what would it look like to make a conscious uh, return or transition to a world that either doesn't have it or has a lot more limits on it? Solarpunk is a a speculative uh, tradition or genre. It seems like a very direct confrontation to capitalist realism because pretty much every solarpunk story challenges something that we take for granted it's i i like to imagine capitalist realism as sort of like this uh like a like a dome like maybe think of like a snow globe we're all living inside this snow globe that's got this artificial ceiling we can't see out past it or at least it obscures our vision a lot but you know that dome is constructed it's constructed by neoliberal ideology and all of these pressures that we face from like the PR industry and advertising. And it's so important that we have tools that, that challenge that artificially limited horizon that break through the glass, punch a hole in it, realize there's something way more beautiful on the other side, or at least that the outside is way bigger than we've ever thought about. We just assume that the horizon of possibility is so much narrower than it really is. I've been reading a lot of um, 
a lot of work by this anthropologist, David Graeber. I've mentioned him on the podcast. I quoted him in like the first three episodes or something like that. Graeber co-wrote this book with David Wengro, um, an anth- anthropologist. No, sorry. Uh, Wengro is an archaeologist. Graeber was an anthropologist. Um, and they go through and it's a it's a really, really uh, bold and lof- lofty goals in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it's this really bold project to basically reimagine human history. We have this very narrow understanding of human history that's sort of this like determinist progression from like a little primitive tribe to like villages and then we start farming wheat and then cities appear and then states show up and it's like this very like straightforward progression. Um, but they go back and actually look at the archaeological evidence and actually look at how societies today have drastically different ways of organizing themselves. And they say like all of these, these narratives, they're kind of just BS. Like this is not, there's, there's no scientific evidence backing up this, this direct progression or this claim that like without um nation states as we understand them we just descend into this like this chaos and lawlessness um he spends a lot of time talking about the work of thomas hobbes um and his sort of like war of all against all and how that was totally just a thought experiment and not actually supposed to be any sort of theory about how we used to behave um anyway it's a great it's a great book uh if you're interested in this sort of solar punk mission of of blowing up these ideas that we take for granted showing how arbitrary they actually are um looking at how many different trends there are in society and culture and how we could just choose to work on different trends of like cooperation and ecological harmony rather than accepting that competitiveness and selfishness are the only aspects of human nature that we can draw on Mm -hmm. so just today as it happened i was listening to the podcast a podcast on i think the bbc on kropotkin like his life and whatever Mm -hmm. and one aspect that i didn't know i like i knew he was like i don't know what his actual i think he was a geographer like he was he was a scientist of some sort and he um obviously wrote the book on uh, mutual aid uh, i think the one of the, i think he was one of the first to use that specific term and he was i think the title of the book is something along the lines of like mutual aid a factor in evolution right that was a conscious reply in some sense like he was he wanted to be in in conversation with the at the time the dominant darwinist especially social darwinist which is different than like darwin himself but whatever the distinction doesn't really matter here which had that imaginary, which I think still exists to, to a large extent today, of, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Thomas Huxley, who was kind of dubbed uh, Darwin's bulldog because he was the one who was like very aggressively pushing for that. And again, there's a nuance here between evolution as it is understood in biology and then social Darwinism as it is understood politically, economically, etc. Those are two different things and people tend to confuse the two. But Huxley's entire thing is that life and the natural world uh, which he then extrapolated from this belief into the human world was, I forgot the par- the, the sentence, something like nasty, brutish, and short, something along those lines. And so as it happened, Kropotkin was in London at the time when this was kind of, uh, he was in exile, obviously, from, from uh, then Imperial Russia, Tsarist Russia. And he wanted he wanted to talk about that and, you know, respond to that. And there was a lot of, he sent a lot of correspondences to Huxley, but that, as far as we know, were never um, answered. And so the reason why I bring this up is that this idea of Kropotkin, and he's not the only one, to be very clear, uh, like he just wrote a book about it uh, at the time, you know, but um, this idea that actually mutual aid, like quite literally helping each other, cooperating, uh, communicating, even not just within the same species, but through different species, this is something that not so, not that long ago, and it's still very much an ongoing thing. We're discovering that, for example, trees actually communicate with one another through those very weird, like, mushroom rhizomic connections and networks. I'm I'm barely understanding all of this. Like, I'm really slowly getting into it. But all these interesting, you know, people, I think, can just look it up these days. There's a book, I think, called The Interesting Life of Trees or something along those lines that gets into all of this. 
And what's very obviously interesting is that if we think of a lot of like indigenous politics, indigenous knowledge, this kind of is taken for granted. And so one of my kind of um, light bulb moments, if you want, is that if there was this entire worldview, and I don't want to romanticize it too much, like there are issues in any society, you know, and so on. But it is a very distinctive thing that in the sort of rational man, again, this is a very gender thing, in the Cartesian sense, and especially after, you know, social Darwinism, which then kind of, again, all of this ended up complementing um, whether it's post-World War II capitalism, whether it's neoliberalism, especially. And I think these, the, again, I don't want to pick, I don't want to, I'm, I'm simplifying just for the, and I also I confuse myself, like just for the, for the purpose of this conversation, obviously. But it is something, there's something to be said that today, we think of Homo economicus, of the myth of the, the rational man, the, the, you know, the market, whatever, as maybe not nice, not, you know, fun, maybe not even the best, but the only, as we said, right, like the only thing that is realistic, quote unquote. And if we think of these different structures, like if, if we're being scientific, if we're applying the method of science and being realistic, not quote unquote realistic, but actually realistic, like being rational, let's put it that way, then we have to take in all sorts of data. We have to take in all sorts of information from all sorts of different maybe communities, maybe even the natural world, like we just need to be objective. Again, I'm using all of this kind of in quotation. And so we have to also take into account the communities and human and non-human that actually do cooperate. And what are they doing that works? Maybe they're doing some things that don't work. Like let's take in all of that data. Let's take in all of that information. And I think there's something to be said, and this is obviously the, the uh, part of what we're talking about, that we don't take into we don't take as much that sort of data because in some sense it's inconvenient like if you t if you really are learning about how trees communicate and how there is this rhizomic which i probably pronouncing wrongly i don't doesn't matter but this network between them and how they're literally communicating and exchanging carbon and just and the fungi kind of take like two percent of some of that and oh man it's so complicated Again, I'm barely understanding all of this. I probably butchered it, but that's kind of the gist of some of it. And then you take this as part, of, if you internalize this in some sense, as like, this is actually also realistic. Well, then you start understanding, I think, that what you have been referring to as realism, as, you know, I'm just being realistic here, is actually a very specific type of belief. And that, that's what Mark Fisher was talking about, obviously, as capitalist realism. So I hope any of the <laughs> what I just said made sense. <laughs> Oh, totally. Yeah. Good. <laughs> the fact the fact that um when you when you have a theory that human nature is inherently competitive, uh which I, I would say that's the dominant theory of human nature in at least in this western neoliberal sort of cultural zone that, you know, I've I've only lived in the US, I've never been outside of it. Um <laughs> So when you when you have this theory that human nature is competitive, any evidence to the contrary, any evidence of humans cooperating is the exception to the norm. That's like that's data that doesn't fit in the model. And for and we've kept, you know, um, I'm really interested in like the philosophy of science, how these theories are formed and how they change and how they're challenged. Um, and we've we've been at a point for the last several decades, I guess, where this theory of humans as homo economicus, as acting in self-interest, we keep trying to modify that theory and like fix it and 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 tidy it up and add new features. Like it's it's got a, it's got its mind, it's got its psychology now. We've just kind of like added things onto it. And even making and this even theory and, sorry, like even try and change the world to fit that theory mm. <laughs> like just if right the theory yeah doesn't work, we need to fix absolutely everything else to make sure that the theory works absolutely like w everything else at the expense of preserving the theory when we could also very easily have a theory of human nature as inherently cooperative or that co cooperation and competition are both these evolutionary trends um so like you said, uh, Kropotkin's work in this area is like super important. This like foundational investigation into like, like challenging the assumption that evolution is just a matter of competition, like cooperation, mutual aid are also a central part of it. Um, and Murray Bookchin's work in social ecology uh, expands on that. Uh, a 
foundational aspect of Bookchin's naturalism is that there are trends in our evolutionary history or natural history that are cooperative, that are about mutual aid and freedom and and making free choices. Um, and I think I think it is high time we we have uh, what like uh, philosophers of science would call a paradigm shift. We need to look at some new theories and see if there's one that better fits the data instead of continuing to just like Frankenstein on this like very long dead zombified homo economicus. Yeah. Uh, I, I live in the city where Frankenstein was written, which is the only claim to fame of the city, I think, <laughs> other than the UN is here. <laughs> but anyway, no, I, I obviously completely agree. And I, f- funny segue, but like speaking of Frankenstein, the idea of, of imaginary is that like, this is going to be a theme that's going to be uh, even like, I'm going to repeat it a number of times and kind of explore different aspects of it throughout throughout 2023 and prob- I mean, probably beyond it, but I'm focusing on this year for now. Again, we're not in 2023, but this is the magic of podcasting. One of the things that I found super interesting, and you know, I've been kind of hampering on this point now for, for a few months, if not a, a year or so, is that it is super easy for us to imagine the end of the world. Like in terms of literally just making that mental effort and that's because for the most part, we're not thinking of anything original. Like we're just, we're borrowing or we're taking in stuff we have seen or some we've heard about, usually in the form of movies, maybe some series, maybe, you know, some books, or maybe in the way of just talking about certain things. This is something that is uh, normal. And in, in, I mean, none of this is none of what, normal is such a contentious term. I don't know what other term to use. Normalize, maybe let's put it that way. It's it's normalized to think of of the end of the world. You know, again, that that often used code of like it's easier to and to to imagine the end of the world and the end of capitalism, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what the the work that we should be doing is making it harder <laughs> to imagine the end of the world than then to let's just making it easier to imagine the end of capitalism. Quite quite simply that. Because the end of the world means the end of capitalism. That's kind of the weird thing about this this lack of imaginary is that we, we kind of think that well we can continue doing capitalism even if capitalism is leading us towards the end of the world. And it's so there is a mental trap there there's something quite literally in how we're thinking and again for listeners i think folks know this by now whenever we explore one aspect of something in depth we will leave out certain other things i think that's just the nature of a conversation so i'm not saying oh like listener who is i don't know on your way to work now or whatever like just open up your mind like fuck that i'm not saying any of that. i'm just saying it's part of the problem it's part of the tools if we want to imagine different um structure we need to quite literally be able to imagine the kind of it's a repetitive thing and that is an action like or that is a that is a skill right that is a muscle in some sense that in the same way as i said that it's very easy to imagine the end of the world what maybe it shouldn't be that easy but it is easy because that muscle has been just like developed you know uh, insaturated at this point right it's just such an easy thing to do but why is it difficult to imagine if i'm picturing an episode of star trek and I talk about Star Trek a bit. The fourth episode of this month, actually, again, January 2023, will be with uh, Jesse Gender, who has this uh, YouTube channel on on science fiction, LGBT issues, autism, and other stuff. But specifically, we spoke about futurisms. And it's going to come out after this episode, if I have my timeline correct. Um, and w- one of the things I like about Star Trek, or other sci-fi, like futuristic stuff, is I picture, my, I picture that world that they're portraying. Because usually, if it's like good sci-fi... It, it's operating on a certain logic, right? It's saying that there is a timeline, this happened in the kind of the universe of Star Trek, the 21st century. So our current century was kind of an ugly one. But then after that, there was like World War Three and whatever. And then after that, kind of humanity got its shit together. There's no money, there are replicators, they just create food out of, you know, wh- whatever, whatever the specifics are. But even in that world, they have, you know, adventures and things happen and they meet some species or... Like stuff happens, human things happen and non-human things as well, because in that world there are like aliens and whatnot. But it's not fantastical in the sense that it's it's sort of within the logic of the universe, it's rooted in something that is quote unquote logical. And so if it if we can imagine something like that, we imagine a world, you know, they go on this planet or this happens or whatever. What I find interesting is 
as a kind of again training that muscle so to speak exercising that that imagine it you know uh, all of that is picturing myself in that or picturing society in general or the world as we know it as that and taking that for granted like this is the new realism this is what it, in that world this is what it means to be quote unquote realistic what are even the boundaries within that logic and you know it's 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 an it's a you know it's an it's an exercise in imagination it doesn't it won't necessarily change your day to day necessarily but it allows me in any case to see the daily life that I'm going through and the logics of the society and societies in which I live because I've moved through many countries now through that lens of well they're operating under a certain logic that logic needs to be questioned you know I'm kind of simplifying obviously but and it allows me to have that because you're you're escaping into a world and then you're coming back to your world you know so to speak um and then you are able to question your world slightly better at least if you're kind of doing you can also just watch it because it's fun but you know if you're kind of doing that exercise and so that that's what i find very interesting about and this is slight awkward segue but i want to talk a bit about hauntology and hauntings and so on but i I, i'll let you kind of respond think through what i just said or what if you wanted to share something because i'm kind of hogging up the space here uh no that was all really great i i don't have much to add i mean that's what i like so much about solar punk uh you know, as, as a speculative genre, it looks at things that are happening now and extends them into the future. Um, but there's no reason that the only future that we can write about is like, you know, more ecological destruction, more capitalism, more advertising. Like, we don't have to just imagine this kind of like cyberpunk future, even if that might be kind of like in cultural vogue right now. Um, but solar punk says well actually there's all these communities who are getting together and like working on permaculture and uh reappropriating uh private spaces for public use um all these things are happening in our world even if we don't have so much even if we don't have as many conversations or stories about them and that's why i think it's really great that we have a genre that's explicitly writing stories about those things or exactly. uh artistically describing those things yeah i just i just hope i have a feeling it will happen if hopefully i'm not just being naive but i have a feeling that cyberpunk is reaching a sort of a certain saturation let's put it that way i personally got a bit bored of uh, cyberpunk aesthetics and part of it was fun growing up you know i i did enjoy watching something but just the aesthetics of it and the underlying logic that I forgot, I think it was William Gibson, but I might get the name wrong, who said like c cyberpunk is high, high tech in low life, essentially. And obviously with, with solar punk, and I've mentioned this a few times already, but with solar punk it's high life, so to speak. And tech, it's a question mark in the sense that tech can be high tech, can be low tech, can be no tech, depending on what the context requires, right? The point is that there are human needs and there are also non-human needs. And in order to meet them, we may use technology or we can use technology and technology can facilitate that. But it's repurposed to be in the service of that, essentially. And so the kind of awkward segue in <laughs> talking about hauntings and hauntology and all of that is that it's it's sort of the other the flip side of talking about imaginaries because i'll kind of give a bit of background for if someone hasn't listened because i think i talked about it in the first episode the one with andre a bit but if if they haven't listened i'll quickly say it again so hauntology sort of started or at least was popularized by derrida in french it sounds the same thing to talk about ontology and uh, ontology it sounds the same thing it's it's a pun and the idea is that he was sort of responding to the famous declaration of the end of history by fukuyama in like 91 or 92 whenever he published it and derrida published his thing in 93 or something and he was like, so Fukuyama said that at the end of history, i.e. the Soviet Union collapse, i.e. communism, quote unquote, or whatever the Soviet model of that was, uh, failed. And, you know, I think I would obviously agree with that. The Soviet Union was a kind of a disaster. But that failed. That wasn't good. That wasn't a good model. Therefore, the reason why the West triumph, again, using the terminology of, of uh, Fukuyama, is that they have a superior model, right? Like this whole uh, liberalism meets capitalism, all of that. And Derrida was sort of saying that in declaring that Marxism the uh, dead, because again, in that context of the early 90s, you've actually created a ghost. You've created a specter. And his, his book was called Specters of Marx. And because now communism is this thing that haunts, again, I'm using Derrida, I'm not saying this what I hear, but this uh, ha communism haunts capitalism, essentially. Okay, that's sort of some of the background. What Mark Fisher, I think, did uh, very interestingly 
is he wasn't just talking about the, these hauntings from the past, right? The past, the Soviet past or whatever, but hauntings from the future, i.e. the hauntings of the future that never came to pass. And communism is one of them. In the context of Lebanon, uh, one of my, the chapters of my PhD actually is on, um, I'm not going to get too much into it, but essentially these uh, visions of the future that a lot of folks had in the 60s and especially in the 70s that never came to pass, but that the people that had them, uh, most of them still exist today. You know, they still live today. So what is their present like? Because their present, it doesn't look like the future that they sort of imagined, right? And this can be um, communism, it can be pan-Arabism in the case of Lebanon, it can be like other isms, pan-Islamism to a certain extent with some, with some folks and so on. And that that did not come to pass, obviously. It doesn't exist in, in the way they pictured it. And so where is that? You know, where is that future? Where does it exist? And the idea is that it's a haunting. Now, haunting, it's easy to imagine it as a literal ghost because it just makes it easier to talk about it and think through it. And I think it's nice to have these mn mnemonic aids anyway. But obviously, it's 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 more like it's a philosoph philosophical concept, and it's one which I do think has an impact on quote unquote the real world. I.e., like it does actually affect how we go about our lives because if we think of them as ghosts and whatnot, it can help explain why it's so difficult to imagine alternatives because those are the only alternatives that we think could have existed, and they're dead. You know, they're haunting us. They're ghosts, they're specters, and phantoms, and whatever. And we don't want that, obviously, because they're dead and therefore they've lost and so on. And so we stick with our current uh, model, our current system. And so the point isn't to say, let's bring back those ghosts and let's let's uh, you know let's do a bit of uh, uh, state Soviet communism or a bit of pan Islam, whatever. That's not the point, obviously. They they've collapsed, they failed, whatever. The point isn't to just go to the past. The point is to ask, well, if they failed, does that doesn't that also mean somehow? that the thing that we are currently living in can also fail, you know, might also fail. Because a lot of the bureaucrats of the Soviet Union never quite imagined that this amazing thing that lasted almost a century in whatever would actually collapse the way it did, but it did. And that certainty, that realism, you know, be re being realistic in the Soviet sense, well, did not save the Soviet Union. So what, what tells us today, given that we know the limits of capitalism and we know the damages that it's, have, it's having, we, we literally know the impacts that it's having on the earth, which has finite resources and whatnot. Why are we so convinced, or at least let's put it differently, why is it so difficult to put a stop to that? Okay, I'm not talking at the structural reasons, because there are those. I'm talking even like on a, on a mental, in a mental way, like quite literally thinking of these alternatives. Okay, this was a much longer introduction than I thought it would be. But oh. talk to us about ghosts, <laughs> or at least how, how you oh think my about gosh. them. <laughs> there, there are so many directions I want to go yeah. here. Oh my God, I don't know where to start. Um, Take a random one. <laughs> okay, I'm just, I'm going to try to go like sort of chronologically through what you said. Um, so something that's really interesting to me about cyberpunk is... Uh, it's very retro futurist yep. at this point. Like it, it seemed kind of, I don't know, fresh and new when William Gibson started writing, when like Neuromancer came out and whatever. Um, but if you look at the aesthetics of cyberpunk, there's like this fear and fascination with Japan. Japan is like the big other in this in this imagined world, and that comes out of World War II. That's like very, uh, that's it's it's a imagined future of the past. It's a different time. People had different concerns. There was this different sort of like xenophobic uh, fear going on. And it's interesting to me to look at uh, people who would call themselves futurists today. Um, I think Elon Musk is a good example. I think he's more of a cyberpunk. Um, there's a fascinating interview. This is a total tangent. There's a fascinating interview that Werner Herzog has in one of his films uh, with Elon Musk. And Musk is saying, you know, I think I think the world, essentially the gist of it is the world is going to go to shit. I'm building these rockets to Mars because I think like we're on a really bad track here. The world's going to a very dark place. I have nightmares at night. I can't think of how to make it better. So he has this very like fantastical idea of the future that's very disconnected from our present situation. It's very disconnected from what scientists are saying would actually lead to a safer, better, healthier future. It's it's the past 
haunting present conceptions of the future. Mm. I mean, the the time is all out of joint. <laughs> exactly. Like, exactly. <laughs> that's that's um why I find hauntology and ghosts and hauntings and traces, whatever you want to call them, like such a powerful conceptual tool. It it seems like a much more comprehensive way to think about our experience of time. We we like to think of time as this simplified linear progression, but that's really, that's not how we experience it. I mean, you know, we have mental formations that we can have things like trauma or like anxiety, the way that we think about and feel and experience time is not linear. It's not chronological. It is being haunted by the past, being haunted by the future. Um, I, I really like Mark Fisher's work in this area because he so he does a lot of like cultural analysis, looking at films, looking at texts. And what's really important about that is he shows kind of like a a cultural process that's happening alongside this more sort of political economic neoliberal process we were talking about. There there's a cultural element to capitalist realism. It's in our literature, it's in our films. Um, he, he talks a lot about the like repackaging of existing things and like nothing nothing truly new is being created. We're seeing repackaged forms of the 70s, 80s. We're seeing these trends just kind of repeat like, okay, now it's time for bell bottoms. Now it's time for skinny jeans again. Like we just keep going in this cycle. I've, I've noticed this of... in, in a lot of, uh, even like in podcasts, there's, there is, I've described like a good chunk of podcasts. I'm talking about Anglophone US centric podcasts that are um, essentially packaging millennial nostalgia. Uh, you know, to, for lack of a better, you know, it's it's often rewatching something that was like popular in the '90s or in the early '20s, and now you can rewatch it with your whatever favorite cast member and whatever, and it's you know episode by episode reliving those experiences or whatever it is. Or it's like you know, there's <laughs> I, I I'm just gonna single it out just because I found it funny. I don't know anything about that podcast. It's pro it might be super good. I have no idea, but it it was like what happened in 1992, and that was the name of the podcast, and it was like why. In music like musically that year was so like revolutionary or whatever it is and i did not buy the premise like when when i when i listened to the the promo you know it's like no this is actually just because there is there is enough content to talk about that specific year but it's just very interesting that we're doing that again i'm not saying no no judgments if folks are really going through no whatever like that's a normal thing but it's very interesting that yes there is a sense that it's almost like we've we've exhausted uh, creative ideas, you know, we've, we've exhausted the new and now we're kind of repackaging to simplify a bit, but like we're repackaging all of these things. Yeah, sorry. No, that was that was great. <laughs> um, yeah, I I wrote a bunch of just like questions and thoughts on hauntology, like some things to ask you. I just I please don't know how much time we have left. We, but I'd love to just get into matter. it some more. Time does not. As we just okay. said, time is not a thing. Yeah, <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So, um, so just in like the, the reading I was doing on hauntology, it seems like a, an, an important tool for understanding this sort of like postmodern world we find ourselves in. I think maybe people have a lot of misconceptions about postmodernism and what it is. I see it. So I come from a literature background. I see it as mostly something descriptive. It's reading the world as a text. Um, and it's sort of we've we've moved away from like a a modernist vision of society or a positive vision for for where we're going, what the world could be. It's it's like kind of this distrust of the future almost. We're we're averted of there's this aversion to to telos, to teleology, to like wh our goals or where we're going. Um, so you wind up in culture, just seeing these kind of like repackaged forms that are all kind of, um, it's, it's the same, it's the same trend we see in technological innovation. Uh, David Graeber again has this really great essay. I think it's called on, on flying cars and the de declining rate of profit or something like that. Um, so he asked the question that, that you were asking just a moment ago, like, why don't we have flying cars? Why don't we have all these fantastic visions of the future? And a lot of it is because in technology, the innovations that we're getting aren't fundamentally new. They're just repackagings or 
combinations of existing forms. So there's this sense of like timelessness and just this extending present that never actually takes us into the future. So something else that um, comes up in, in conversations about temporality is this idea of like the long or protracted present. And I was wondering how you see that in relation to a the Hauntology. I was wondering how you see that in relation to hauntology. It, it, it's it's sort of it's it's like it's cousin. I mean, it's it's both work at the same. So the protracted now is one of the terms I think it got a Lebanese uh, theorist called Walid Raad used, but it's very similar to like the hauntological now, which I think Mark Fisher himself used. And the idea is just that the present is extended, like we are stuck in the present and it's a very different type of being of being in the present because you can think of oh you know i'm meditating and i'm being in the now that's not what we're talking about it's literally like you're in in this because the past is sort of a blurry thing in let's i'm kind of using these metaphors uh i'm trying to kind of use mnemonic aids for even listeners if that helps i mean it helps me but so that's what the past is it's kind of it's it's a question mark in many ways and the pre and the future is impossible like the future cannot be conceptualized it's n simply not something that can be conceptualized and what ends up happening is that what we think of as the future ends up actually being a repackaging in many ways and this is not to say like just to be very nuanced here or very clear it's not to say that one cannot have original ideas or that innovations do not exist or whatever that's not the point the the argument is more that even those original ideas even those innovations even this newness this thing that is created or is taught you know from scratch or whatever whatever it may be even all of that ends up actually having to conform in one way or another to a pre-existing pattern or to you know i don't know something very simple is that you have an idea a project idea or whatever it is uh, and you you think you know it can be revolutionary or whatever and i'm not to, please i'm not talking about startup <sighs> I, you know even even when we talk i have to f remember that there are these existing things that, be, that that can come to people's minds and so when i'm talking about like quite literally you 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 want to explore something you want to discover something new whatever it is in order to do so, you need to think of how to get there, right? And so you need to think of the resources that you need. Maybe if you're already rich, I mean, you're lucky. If you're not, you need to find money somehow. So maybe you work for a few years or maybe you find a loan from the bank or whatever it is. And all of that already affects the project itself or the idea itself. It's not like, you know, it's not that in Star Trek, part of the easiness of that is that for the most part, they can just explore something because whatever technological requirement is needed to do so has already been invented like simplifying but so so they're able to have these what you might think of as thought experiments but actually just have them on the screen and and imagine them in that sense so the anyway the protracted now is the is the inability to do that is is or at least is the resulting temporality from the inability to do that uh, and it's what we see today but i think to some extent it's what we've seen for some time now at the very least, like it's very difficult to have a concrete timeline and that will depend on where you live. And maybe this doesn't affect you and you don't live in it and that's fantastic for you. But for most folks, I think these days, it's like roughly it started before me and you were born, I think, like 70s, 80s, and kind of peaked or has been peaking for some time now. Whether it collapses, whether it changes, I have no idea, obviously. And part of why I have no idea is that it's difficult to imagine the future. So we're gonna we go back to the to the initial problem in many ways. Yeah. So, so why is it? Why is it so difficult? What's standing in the way? I wanted to do like, like a seance and bring these ghosts out. What, what ghosts are you seeing? I think, I think of very concrete things sometimes. Like I, I really think of what does it take or why is it that I go to a family lunch or I am sitting at a cafe and starting chatting with the old lady next to me, what, whatever these situations may be, what stops me? Uh, and you know, this is a me thing, but it may, I'm just having a thought experiment here. What stops me from talking to that person or that relative or whatever it is about completely different worlds, right? Like wh what is this thing that prevents me? And I think it has to do with capitalist realism in the sense that I actually feel in many ways that like I can be talking to that person. Maybe that person says, well, actually that sounds like a nice idea, you know, whatever it is. But then the, the link between oh, this is a nice idea, it would be nice and whatnot, but, oh, this can actually be done, we can actually do this today, that link is sort of severed. And the why, I mean, in many ways, it's it's a consequence of, 
learned helplessness, uh, the fact that it is actually difficult to think of anything new anyway when you're used to something. Like just again, that that mental process itself is not an easy thing to do, at least not definitely not an easy thing for me to do. And that even when you when one imagines like all of those, uh, let me put it this way, like I think if there is a lot of it, if there are a lot of solo punk stories and it becomes normalized as an imaginary in the same way that cyberpunk is normalized and imaginary, I think the conversation would be very different. Let's put it that way. So mm -hmm. maybe we're just chatting at sort of the, you know, the the beginning of something. If we're hoping that this trend, and I I have I have some, I think we can have some reason to believe that it will continue to kind of expand and expand and expand as an imaginary, largely because it's responding to an actual need. Like it's not a. It's not just like we're just having fun for the sake of it, but we're actually like the thing that differentiates solar punk, especially from, I think, from a lot of other genre, if not most other genre, is that for the most part, solar punk tries to be practical in the sense that even if you're imagining like, oh, this is my what my city would look like in 2060 or whatever. And even if you're imagining some fantastical element to it like you know you can communicate with elephants or whatever it is like some something that doesn't exist let's say in, in our current reality even if there is that element you're doing so in the hope that it can or at least a lot of the writers who write these stories are do so and are doing so in the hope that it can influence the reader's perception of our current reality and that's very different from you know i don't know reading lord of the rings which is a classical example i use because i was really into it growing up i still kind of you know i'm talking and all of that. i it's a nice escapism, but I don't read those stories in the kind of with the assumption that, oh, how, how is this going to better my life, right? Or how is this going to not just better my life, but why, how can we model our current society and change our current society based on the ideals of those societies in Middle Earth? I don't find them as I ideals, right? I don't find them as better necessarily. Maybe they're nicer and more photogenic but they're not necessarily you know something to emulate in the in the present world although aspects of them are nicer than our current world which says more about our current world than about them to be honest but um yeah <laughs> that's that's part of it anyway one thing that we in in our chat like in our uh pre pre recording thing you th i think you wrote something I, I wrote it here like getting through the depressing part is how we realize the positivity and in many ways like mm. it's sort of this uh thing of Again, using the mnemonic aid of like ghosts, you know, in at least in, in like Christian mythology and whatnot, you can exorcise those ghosts. And again, I'm just using this as shorthand, folks listening to this, you do not need to need, need that mnemonic aid necessarily. Think of whatever helps you or, you know, something that may be more uh, easier in your, you know, on your own cultural context or whatever it is. But if, if, if this helps you, then think of it this way, like what can we do to exercise those ghosts? Because part of, in the mythology itself, like in the, in the culture itself and whatnot, in that specific culture is like, you have to identify the ghost, maybe you have to name the ghost, and then maybe you have some counter spell or, you know, wh whatever it is to, to exercise that ghost, right? Like, but first you ha it has to start with identifying it, right? Like you have to know, you have to name it. Naming it is actually an important thing in, in that whole exorcism thing. Like if folks think of those movies, like The Exorcist, uh, if I remember well, like the exorcist literally names the devil, right, in order to exercise whatever. So that 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 idea of being able to name it, I think, helps a lot. And I think being able to understand capitalist realism as that, as like, yes, it's a realism, but realism doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean this is the realistic thing to do. In the same way that scientism is not scientific necessarily, it, aspects of it might be but in and of itself is a belief. And that belief mm -hmm. has like assumptions, has a structure, has a logic, you know, has whatever it may be. And they can be deconstructed, they can be taken apart and we can replace them with things that we think are better. And th that's, that's the exercise. It's a very difficult one. Like I get lost even thinking about it, but it's one that I think the more it is done and the more people do it and the more we get, it becomes easier to do it with the aid of um, cultural stuff, like again, series, movies, books, whatever, in the same way, to not to repeat myself too much, but in the same way that it's super easy for us to imagine those apocalypse, zombies, whatever, uh, quite literally, I think I can say this with confidence, like every single person listening to this has that in mind right now, as I'm saying so, as I'm like talking about like those apocalypse, zombies and whatnot, I want it to be as easy to, to do, if not easier, obviously, ideally. To, to imagine those other uh, futures as being realistic, 
like again not just a utopia where i'm just escaping into middle earth and the shire and i'm enjoying myself with some hobbits but it's like literally i want this vision that i'm thinking about to feel like it's a realistic vision because that that's always been the power of cyberpunk is that you're watching these futures mm -hmm. and they kind of feel like they may happen they're not nice we don't want them to happen but it sort of feels that we're going that way you know elon musk as you mentioned like that that's basically it's been internalized and you know obviously it's a scary thing that you know one of the richest men in the world thinks that way but that is the case that and we know that this is actually paul like he's a very good example of this poverty of the imagination actually we can make that argument um but yeah walkers i talk too much like walkers with the, this idea of like the, the you know the something that's very depressing like cyberpunk which is obviously very depressing but not just cyber, like the stuff that we've been talking about these ghosts how how can they lead us so to speak or how can studying them or whatever it is actually realize the positivity that we can explore better if that makes sense oh totally yeah i i mean i can speak to this from personal experience uh this and this kind of takes us back to the start of our conversation when we're talking about neoliberal philosophy so that that was the focus of my research for a while um and something that you realize pretty early on when you start studying basically the philosophy that inspires the realism of the present. Maybe that's, that's a good way to put it. Um, there, there's a feeling, there's a feeling in the world of ontology of the things that exist. Um, and some of those things might be like markets and participants in those markets, the self as an enterprise, personal branding, human capital, all of these things, these are these are objects that have been defined that can be entered into like economic equations that can be worked with. Um, and there's there's a sense that it's ontological, that's very foundational, uh, just sort of like neutrally describing objects. But when you when you sort of break that apart, and understand it as a hauntology as you know the they're never fully present it's a, always already absent present that probably makes no sense but <laughs> no that does make sense <laughs> i think i do think the absent present is very, like i think it, that's the hauntological present right like that's a present that we think might exist or sh maybe should have existed by now but doesn't so it makes sense um if you've read derrida anyway <laughs> so <laughs> i don't i don't know how much explaining to do for for the audience uh, but you know the the ghostliness of of these presences they're like they're half presences they're they're not really of our time they're kind of of the past but also not really belonging to the past either um what's what's really cool about that is you can you can start to see through them you can like pass your hand through it realize that barrier isn't really as solid as you thought and it's still there you're still looking at it it's still shapes your thinking but there is an outside to it there's a constructedness of it um so so my personal experience uh with with coming to this research um i was so back in college i was dealing with like a lot of mental health issues feeling very depressed um sort of just i guess about myself but also about the state of the world. I, I actually entered college to study ecology. Um, so, you know, I'm, I was really interested in ocean acidification, particularly, which is this horrible thing that's happening where little sea creatures can't make their shells anymore because the ocean got too acidic. Um, and that's a really, there, there's a lot of, a lot of tragedy and hopelessness and pessimism. I mean, it's all summed up in that term doomerism. I think that's, that's kind of like the zeitgeist of our, I don't know about world or generation or culture, what would be the correct category there, but it's very present. Um, and I started the, the first book I read actually um, sort of on this subject was capitalist realism. And I could not have chosen a better introduction because Mark Fisher um, also had personal struggles with mental illness. And in his work, including in Capitalist Realism, he talks about the, the personal aspects and the political aspects of depression and how maybe we need to stop personalizing these feelings so much. And actually, there can be a lot of healing and recovery in 
understanding problems not as our own personal problems but as political ones as constructed problems and that was that was so important for me to hear and it really set me on this track of yeah i guess like of séance of recognizing these ghosts of seeing how things that i felt were unchangeable that were oppressing me um were actually a little a little less present a little more absent than i thought i can actually work to think outside of them um i don't know where i'm going with no, this I mean, that, but that, that's right like honestly like i i completely identify with that and that, that's kind of the difference between when i've been doing therapy for some time now but i found it most helpful when the therapist was able and that was a, a previous therapist was able to sort of help me frame uh, some of my problems not just as a me thing like not just as like my internal what happened when I was nine or, you know, whatever, like, oh, it's something that you can pinpoint to your specific past, but maybe something that actually happened in your surroundings, maybe something that you've taken in, maybe, you know, whatever it may be. And I've understood better, I think, and by understanding it better, I, I've kind of regained a sense of my own agency in some in some sense, that the especially anxiety at the time, but also depression, like I'm, I'm on antidepressant now as well they they are not just something that i have had to deal with because it's just what it is right like there, there are like concrete reasons why this happened and part of the reason why it's so difficult to overcome it or to move beyond it or whatever whatever term we want to use here why isn't there more of an emphasis as well like just to kind of stay on the specific topic on like what can be done as a group or a community or as a society or as a nation or you know however one wants to scale it up but why aren't there more things that are done, let's say, on that side to make this less of a recurring phenomenon, right? And a good chunk of that reason, if not the main reason, I think Fisher argues that way, and I think I think we both agree on that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we live in, in, in an economic system and a framework and a zeitgeist and whatever one term, paradigm, whatever, where this is simply not the priority, where even tackling anxiety and depression or whatever is basically only good insofar as it, as it makes you a more productive subject, right? As it makes you like, oh, that's not good to be depressed and whatnot because you're not working well, you're not earning a good enough salary and, you know, wh whatever, whatever the logic in that specific, uh, you know, there are different examples there, but the underlying logic is essentially, I think is essentially that, that ultimately the good isn't the thing, the, the good thing that can come out of this, this therapy session, whether it's group or individual, or this, I don't know, medication in some cases, whatever the specifics might be, the point of the um, of getting better should be that it's you're getting better because this is good for you, because it's good to be better, <laughs> to, to, to heal, let's put it that way. I don't want to use a productivist uh, language, but like to heal from something, right? Like to go through a process of healing and so on. It's, it's not as efficient in the current world we live in not because of like that individual therapist necessarily, although there are some shitty therapists, obviously, lots of them. It's not it's not just like, oh, oh, you know, what it's not just the specifics. Like I'm trying to be as broad as I can here. It's not those specific individuals who live in that. It's that usually the framework that is used is by default limiting or limited because you can't question like I can't usually if I go to the therapist and this has happened right, to give a very concrete example. And I say like, yeah, I'm I'm anxious and I'm depressed because I'm a migrant in Switzerland and because that wasn't easy, especially back when I started. And because I come from a context in Lebanon where like I've seen shit and I've seen, I've lived through like difficult things or whatever it may be. And usually like it's not like, OK, let's talk about that or what have you. Although there are some therapists who would say that it's like, OK, but let's discuss how this has affected you. And what can you do about it to uh, not let it affect you? Now, that's important. I'm not saying that's not important. Or not let it destroy you. Let's put it that way. That's, that's an important skill or whatever. But it's limited because it doesn't, it cannot, in the tools themselves, doesn't tackle the thing that caused the trauma in the first place, right? Like Because it's not a societal, it's not a society-wide framework. It's an individualistic framework. So ideally, you have all of them at the same time, obviously. Uh, although I think arguably if you have all of them at the same time, at some point the individualized method would not be as needed in the same way, if that makes sense. 
Uh, but that that's sort of how I, I, I think I've been thinking about it. And that's why like therapy for me has been important, but I'm getting to a point where I feel like I need something that's not just that, or at the very least something that, that goes beyond that. that. That's just me though. Right. No, that's a great point. It's It's a very nuanced point, but that nuance is really important. <laughs> you know, it's not, the problem is not therapy or medication or this like, healing process the problem is how it's implemented that's why i think um psychopolitics is a really critical concept to understand uh these these technologies i I think of them as technologies psychotherapy as a technology um become technologies of power so a good example would be like like a human resources department at a company you can go in and you can talk to someone about the problems you're experiencing but the department is not there to make you to make you healthy i mean they kind of are it's not that they're not there yeah they're they're not there for your benefit they're there to protect the company's bottom line and they it is this is oversimplifying but i mean it is cheaper to like erase any opposition you're having on an individual level rather than restructuring the company and that's that's a great role for therapy for psychology within this very like privatized neoliberal system um is to solve problems on the most individualized personalized scale possible rather than restructuring society in a way where you know we're not all constantly surveilling ourselves and uh disciplining ourselves like that leads to a hell of a lot of anxiety and if we could not feel so much pressure to be productive and to like heal ourselves so that we can be more productive. Like if there isn't that constant demand on our psyches, I think we'd be a lot happier, but that also requires a bigger structural shift. Um, I had another, but you feel like you see that all of even this conversation in many ways is sort of like haunted by those, those ideas and those concepts. And then that, that's why I find it a very useful thing to be honest. Like it's, and it just again as a mnemonic device, it's easy. It's kind of easier to think of something that is otherwise very abstract if you're able to not necessarily personify it, but like to think of it as something concrete in in one way or another. Um, just as something that's like it's next to you. You know, it's not necessarily you, but it's affecting you in, in that sense. That's why a like, ghost is such an. And I think I think most people can imagine ghosts. So that that makes it useful as well. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, the last thing I wanted to mention on that is um, the concept of responsabilization. I think I'm one of my book recommendations is going to be a book about this. Um, a, another critical component of neoliberal ideology is personal responsibility. And there's this idea that we are, as as the self as enterprise, we are responsible for our productivity and our happiness and our health. And these concepts all just kind of blend into each other. So you wind up with... Um, like on a very fundamental physical level, there are policies in place. Um, like in the UK, this like return, th- this um, what's it called? I I don't remember what it's called, but the idea is that um, the goal of therapy is for you to return to work. So you're provided with these um, resources as long as you're looking for jobs and as long as the the goal of your healing is to become a productive citizen again it's like all kind of collapsed into this incentive structure and that that influences like literal policies and the landscape of society and how you navigate it you have to interact with these things so it totally makes sense that you're going to internalize them and think that it is your responsibility and it is your fault that you're not happy um, when really it could be something as concrete as, you know, your health benefits were just taken away because of a policy. That's not that's not your fault, but it can feel like it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what like to find a way to synthesize everything we've just said, which is not going to work. So I'm going <laughs> to fail and I'm just going <laughs> to fail. But th- being able to um, and also because just to slowly uh, wrap up because we've been talking for about an hour and a half um, and uh, there should be an upper limit on podcasts I have learned <laughs> but um, and yeah I mean I, I think we're gonna do other episodes eventually anyway but for now 
the um, the synthesis in some sense is that okay there are these ghosts and they can be um they can be identified like there are actual conceptual tools that are actually they sound fancy and difficult and maybe at at first they may sound intimidating but i generally think that they are relatively approachable in the sense that you can by using these mnemonics um shortcuts maybe we can think of like quite literally imagine ghosts and understand why are these ghosts still present around us and more kind of deeply maybe if that's the correct term why are we still sort of stuck in thinking about and in, in not being able to think because we're stuck about futures that in, on some level we know or imaginary is alternative imaginary that we kind of know on even like on an I don't know emotional level maybe or like on on some deep level or whatever that they shouldn't be that difficult like what is what there's this thing that happens on a scaling like when we scale things up right like when I think of mutual aid and I talk about mutual aid most folks even most folks I think listening to this can picture this working with like very close friends maybe some relatives you know like sure of course I'm not going to you know make my sister pay if she needs something you know maybe I'm just going to help her out or whatever it may be we, we, there's it's kind of an instinctual thing almost like okay because it's within the paradigm in which we exist mutual aid is acceptable if it is within certain uh structures right so within certain frameworks usually the family but maybe like oh a close your best friend you treat that best friend like your sister or your sibling or your brother or whatever what, whatever it may be you know that sort of thing and it's like oh that's no one that's a good healthy way of friendship but like you know we kind of imagine that like well the nature of that friendship is that you can be there for one another you can complement each other each other's needs maybe maybe you have something to help that you can offer and maybe that person can offer you know there can be some kind of exchange you know mutual aid you know, what whatever it may be or doing something without necessarily the the expectation that they have to do something in return you know that sort of thing but when we scale it up then it becomes a matter of like, that's just not realistic right? like that's not some, that too many things and to be clear scaling anything is always by definition more complicated but complicated does not mean uh, not feasible and it doesn't mean not realistic like those are two very three very different things that we tend to actually mix up quite a lot i think in in like day to day discourse something can be super complicated but is actually very feasible and might be better than something that feels simpler but is not very good like it's much simpler to imagine a world where it's like a dog eat dog you know again this whole nasty british short thing belief where it's all homo economicus that's very easy to actually imagine it but clearly that's not a good thing that's happening so we can imagine something that's more complicated but can actually be more realistic more feasible more you know what have you so that that's what I would kind of these are my like my final thoughts or whatever and I'll leave it up to you to sort of also like give us like some of your like kind of final reflections at least for the pur- purpose of this episode like this conversation and then continue on with like your recommendations on like the the three books if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um no that's a great summary. Uh I think you're right. You're spot on with like just because something is complicated doesn't mean it's not realistic. Um, I just wanted to say, like, studying the the intellectual history of neoliberalism, you realize that this was a very complicated project. It is still complicated to try to maintain it. There are just so many people working on it who are involved in theorizing and policymaking. This, it might feel um, like it's a, like, it might feel like we have simple explanations um, on an everyday level, but those are really just like tiny pieces of neoliberal philosophy that we've internalized. It is not a whole comprehensive picture. It is a very complicated one, a very complicated history, and a very concerted effort on the part of philosophers and politicians and business people to implement it. And if they can do it, we could do something else. Already, <laughs> Everything takes hard work. They already imagined a future that they wanted or whatever metaphor we want to use. And it sort of happened. And obviously it didn't happen perfectly as much as like it didn't happen in the exact same way that they imagined it, but like close enough. Uh, and so there's no yeah. reason why we, you know, can't do that as well. I find it, I find it weirdly inspiring in a twisted way. Like they, they did establish a, a new way of doing things when we needed a new way of doing things. It's just, there are some very major problems with it. It's time to make another one, but, but these things are possible. They happen. People change the world all the time. There, 
this this sense of realism, capitalist realism, that nothing is changing, total total illusion. The world is changing all of the time. <laughs> so I guess that's that's where I would end. Uh, things are going to change no matter what, and it's up to us to to direct those changes, to come up with ideas, to organize, to make the changes we want to see. Yeah, to quote, I think Octavia Butler in The Power of the Sower, like the only the only constant is change. Like God is change, mm, as she would put it in that book. But like the only constant is change. The difference, and that's like one of the mottos of degrowth, is like it's either degrowth by design or degrowth by disaster. Like the, the or like mm. change by design or change by disaster. Like as in change is inevitable. Like that's just how the world, that's just how reality is. Uh, but we we need to make the argument that we can have agency over that change in order to redirect it in a way that we feel is beneficial for like most humans or like for all humans and non-humans as well for that matter. Absolutely. that That's a perfect quote to end on. Um, so I'll just give my, my book recommendations. Yeah. I've been trying, like thinking throughout this conversation, narrowing it down to three. Um, I mean, definitely top of the list uh, would be Byung Chul Han's uh, Psychopolitics. That it's just like a it's a tiny little book. You can read it in an afternoon, but it's given me so many ideas. It was kind of like the starting point for this research project. Um, and then one I don't hear people talk about a lot, but I think is really really great. So this is Melinda Cooper's Family Values, um, and that's a really interesting investigation into how neoliberalism has become aligned with neoconservative values. Um, because if you think about it on the face of it, it seems like they'd be kind of contradictory, at least based on uh, most leftist analysis of liberalism. It seems like they'd be contradictory, but they do have this really interesting synergy. And she goes through all of the policies, um, mostly focusing on the history of the U.S. and uh, policies after the New Deal. Um just great great book really can't recommend it enough um and then i guess my last recommendation uh for just kind of a general overview of i guess a neoliberal ontology which should maybe be understood as a hauntology um pierre dardot and christian laval the new way of the world on neoliberal society and that one much larger volume um but that sort of touches on psychopolitics a little bit, but then goes into more of a Foucault um, biopolitics and enterprise self analysis. And they go really in depth into that enterprise model, how it looks, how it manifests. Um, and that's just kind of a great like catch all starting point for where you want to go. Awesome. Well, I mean, I think it says already a lot that we said, well, we'll, we'll keep it to around an hour and it's been an hour and 45, whatever, 44 <laughs> minutes. But I mean, that just it just shows that there's just a lot to talk about. And I really hope and I think like we can just do more of them. Like eventually, you know, we can just plan more episodes and whatnot. Your, your podcast is uh, Solar Punk Now. I obviously recommend folks listening to it. This episode would also be there as sort of like a collab thing. Um, and uh, yeah, Luca, thanks a lot for this. This was like lots of fun. Make, give me Gave me a lot to think about. And as I said, I'm sure we will do it soon-ish again. Another one. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. The Fire These Times is hosted by myself, Joey Ayoub. I am also its producer, researcher, writer, and sound editor. If you want to help turn this project into a full-time job, please head out to patreon.com slash times to support it. These episodes are part of a bigger project which includes resources, a newsletter, and eventually YouTube video essays as well. As always, thank you for listening and take care.